sing it out with faith this morning. Mountains are still being moved. Yes. Strongholds are still being loose. God, we believe it. Yes, we can see it. That wonders are still what you do. Bodies are still being raised. Giants are still being slain. God, we believe it. Yes, we can see it. That wonders are still what you do. We are here.
you're filled with the Spirit, I want you to begin to sing out. Pull that sound out from your heart. You know that heaven is moved by the sound that you make. Nobody else can move his heart quite like you can. So come on, lift up your voice. Sing out your praise wherever it is you're at. Sing out your burdens. Sing out your promises. Sing out whatever is going on right now. Just let it out. if ever there was a time to reach out for the presence of God, it's right now. How many are facing a storm this morning? I want you to put your hands up if you're in the middle of a storm of your life, you're in a fight. There's hope for you. There's hope for you in this room this morning. His presence is here and there's hope for you. So when we sing this song out and we declare that there's another in the fire, there's hope for you because Jesus is standing with you in the fire. Come on, sing it with faith this morning. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in and When I look at the 
space between where I used to be and this reckoning. I know I can never be alone. Sing it out. There was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding? How I've been set free There is a cross that bears the burden Where another died for me There is another in the fire Should I fall in the space between What remains of me and this reckoning Either way I will bow to the Between us, nothing stands between 
holding back the sea and should I ever need reminding how good you've been to me I'll count the joy come every battle cause I know that's where you'll be there'll be another in the fire there'll be another in the fire Oh, come on, he's not done this morning. I believe that there's gonna be something released here in this place today that is gonna shake and change your life. That as we declare the ancient truth that there is nowhere we can go, where can we hide from his presence? If we make our bed even in hell, he's there. Jesus is all around you this morning. He's calling your name. He's knocking on the door of your heart. So we wanna sing this together in faith. And I want every voice to sing it as loud as you can with all the faith in your heart as we declare that there's another in the fire that you're facing this morning. Come on, sing it out. Another in the fire Standing next to me There'll be another in the waters Holding back the sea Should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I count the joy it it starts getting past the surface and goes to the core of who we are do we really trust in the Lord do we really believe that he'll come through and you know the old saying don't birth an Ishmael you know it's tied with Abraham 
waited 13 years, God had a great promise. It was like, I don't, I don't, I believe it's gonna happen, but I need to maybe move this thing along. And so he did some things that did not circumvent the purposes of God, but it, it created difficulty. Actually, kind of the Muslim, Christian, Jewish rivals that happened in the world were because of that one decision. Two different sons, Isaac, Ishmael. So there's a temptation to kind of help God. You ever have that? I mean, when we moved back here from Canada after being there 10 years, I remember as clear as a bell, I, had, I came back in June, right, right after I left Father's Day, it was my last Sunday in Canada, moved here, got unpacked. I mean, we were, we were living with friends in Hinkley. They had a big house, so they kind of gave us a section of it. Kids slept on the floor. You know, it was like a two-month campout trip, a camping trip. And so, you know, I was thinking, okay, I wasn't even sure we were going to start a church, but then word came, several different sources, Graham Cook and others, started a church. I felt faith for it, so we started planning, but that would be in September. So by June, by the end of June, we've been here a few weeks. We need a place to live. We started looking everywhere from Richfield to, you know, it's funny because I'd purposed in my heart because I lived in Brunswick before. We're not moving back to Brunswick. In fact, I was going to start our church in Middleburg Heights, Berea. And the Lord, you just see what happened, you know. We end up in Brunswick. There is something special about Brunswick. So I thought, well, okay. But I'm not going to live in Brunswick. So Lord, just open up doors outside the Brunswick limits somewhere else. Nothing opened up, nothing. And so we started looking for rentals, you know. And we're walking around. Now, remember, I'm unemployed. No sure promise of a job. I'm going to start a church. I don't know if you know, but it's not like an instant success when you start a church. You know, it's, it takes time. And I got four little kids and everything else. And, and so I'm there like, wow, what are we going to do? And I met with my financial mentor, who's still a financial mentor to me today. He's a builder. He said, hey, I got a house in, over here you might like. I mean, we're getting ready to either make it a model home or, or sell it. He just built an entire subdivision. It's kind of the last ones available. I said, go check it out. I said, what price range? He tells me, I said, yeah, no, that's, that's a little high for us because I mean, I don't have a job right now. I gotta get, I gotta get a loan. They're gonna ask me, do you have a job? You know, do you have money? I had Canadian money. Might as well have had Monopoly money at that point, you know? And, uh, he said, I said, where is it? He says, well, it's over in Brunswick. You know where it is. I'm like, ah, Bob, don't really want to go to Brunswick. He goes, well, just go over there and check it out. So we walked through this house and it was, in that moment of time, it was our dream house. It really was, but it was so far out of reach from an unemployed Canadian bank account guy with four kids. But you know, we had some friends that had more faith than we did. We went in the backyard and they said, I think we just need to claim this place right now in Jesus' name. I'm like, well, are you going to help pay the payment? And, you know, we did. We claimed it. And long story short, we ended up moving in. I mean, we lived two months without flooring. <laughs> we just had whatever it is, you know, uh, yeah, plywood, basically, you know. We had to buy our kids slippers so they didn't get splinters in their feet, you know. But we were in the dream. You know, it wasn't complete yet, but it was all a step of faith. I tell you, he plucked us out. So I moved into that house almost two and a half months before I had the job, the church, what we, we are so blessed with now. Yeah, two months, you know, either I was young and naive. I mean, I was 39, that's not real young. But I just believed God. I was living on a prophetic promise. I'm going to look back at it now and it kind of scares me to death, except that I've faced many more of those things since then. We stand in the middle, which all you have is the Word of God. Many of you are in that place right now, especially those that are at home watching this. And there's probably a lot of you today. When I woke up, it was 13 degrees. It actually reminded me of Canada. 
It's cold. It's cold out today, but beautiful. Sparkling snow. What an environment right now. You are in a place, those at home and those here right now, and I want to pray for you. All that to say, stand. When you know you're in the right place, I mean, you have little fleeting doubts, but you're wrestling those to the ground. You're saying, I'm, 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 I'm going to stand in this. I'm going to take my stand. I'm going to stand in this field. I'm going to defeat this ground. I'm, def I'm going to claim and, and protect this land that is mine, this property is mine, this promise that is mine. That promise can come into shape of many different things. But if you're standing on the edges of a promise right now, I want you to raise your hand around the room. I want to pray for you. Standing, look at that. I mean, it's, like, it's like half the crowd. That's only the hands I can see. So keep them raised just for a moment. I want to pray for you. I, I felt during that last song, we're going to move into another song here quickly and, and kind of move, well, in a similar direction, really. But I want to pray for you right now. It's as simple as this. We don't have to get all emotion. I mean, I, I'm all into jumping up and down and you know, doing whatever actions that you see us doing. You know, there's something powerful and prophetic about moving your body, you know. But right now, I just want you to stand and believe. Stand and believe that this promise is going to come to pass. Yes, there's people who bring bad reports. There's giants in the land. There's walled cities in there. How could you even think that you could do that? We were grasshoppers in their eyes. Therefore, we became grasshoppers in our eyes. You can believe that or you can be like Caleb that says, they are our bread we can devour them if we move quickly that's the report I want to believe and so right now Lord in the midst of coronavirus in the midst of joblessness in the midst to antichrist environments all around us we stand in the midst of that Lord, your promises are not affected by our surroundings. They are only affected by the belief in our heart. And so, Lord, we believe. We believe, Lord, that this promise is of you. We believe, Lord, that great things are in our future, that your purposes are with us, Lord God. And we lean into that right now. This is all you need to do. Really, in your heart, all you need to do is say, I believe. You can even add this, it's scriptural. Help me in my unbelief, <laughs> but I believe. It's funny, Jesus didn't say, hey, until you get that full belief, I can't give you what you're asking for. <laughs> when the guy says, help me in my unbelief. So right now you can be honest and just say, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. And I pray, Lord, for hints of this to happen in their lives this week. I plant the seed of Christ in you in the name of Jesus. He is the rock that followed you 40 years in the wilderness. He is the rock that gave you the water that you drank from so that you were not thirsty. He is the rock of salvation that will sustain you through your entire life, even to the day you pass on from this life to the other. He is the rock. And so we stand on the rock. The winds and waves come in on all sides. The house on the rock stands firm. And I pray, Lord, for a firmness and a strength to be upon Bethel Cleveland in the midst of every difficult situation. We thank you, Lord, right now that you are our victor. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Jay, take us into the next song here real quick. Just remain standing, or if you can stand up just for a few minutes, we want to cap this off right now as our prayer and worship before God. And I think Jerry's going to come up and lead us in communion also here in just a minute. Peace. 
Just raise your hand. We've got some ushers coming down really quickly that uh, they'll hand them out there to you. But why they're doing that, let me just read here in 1 Corinthians where, where the Lord, our, our Jesus, he encouraged us to take communion. And in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, verse 23, the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Joshua 4, it's just, it, 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 we're, we're here remembering what Jesus did for us. This is why we are taking communion. The same in which God instructed Joseph, uh, Joshua to take 12 stones and, the, and to lay them down so that the generations won't forget what I have done for you in bringing you into a promised land. This we are taking, remembering what Jesus did for us on a cross. He died for my sins and for you, to give me and you hope, life, freedom, deliverance, wholeness, you name it. He paid for it on the cross. And so we wanna, we wanna do this in just remembering the Lord and for what he did. So. If you have it, take this wafer right here. This represents his body that was broken for us so that we could be whole, we could be healed, we could be free. And when we take this, we are remembering that what he did for on the cross was for you and for me. Let's, let's eat it. And this juice in this cup represent, represents his blood that was shed, that gave us access to the Father. No longer did it have to be a goat or a bull, but Jesus paid the ultimate price that we could have freedom and we could have a relationship with our Creator, our Father. And when we drink this, we're remembering that the blood of Jesus has not lost its power 2,000 years later. It is still powerful, saving and setting all of us free. Let's drink it. Father, we thank you for what you've done for us. We remember you and your goodness, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Set your people free. Amen. All righty. Hey, give the Lord Jesus a hand clap. Welcome someone to Bethel Cleveland. We're so glad that you're here and you're watching online. Pastor Cindy. Yep. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everyone. It's good to have you. Is anyone here for your very first time today? Want to raise your hand? Just let us know that you're here. Yes. Let's give them a welcome. Good to have you. We have this interesting thing called a QR code. If you haven't heard of it, up here you'll see. If you're visiting with us, want to take out your cam camera on your smartphone, hold it up there. It will uh, provide a link for you on your phone is, and direct you to a form if you wouldn't mind filling it out. That's our 21st century visitor card. If you have any trouble with that, you're welcome to stop at our visitor table on the way out. We have a gift for you if you were able to do it with the QR code or whether you need some assistance back there. We have lovely woman back there that will give you all the help that you need and we have gift, uh, um, a gift for you on your way out. So thanks for stopping by to check us out. Welcome to everyone else.
else. Um, deeper Bible study is happening on Wednesday night. We had a bigger crowd this last week. We're building our uh, Wednesday night Bible study back. You can join us in person right here at 7 p.m. in Brunswick, or you can actually check us out online. It's streaming there at BethelCleveland.com. If you have any trouble um, or you tried last week and couldn't do it, um, you can uh, email office at BethelCleveland.com, and they will help you uh, know where to find it and make sure that you can uh, join as our pastors go through um, a line upon line Bible study on Wednesday night. Also, Encounter Night with Chris Gore is coming February 28th at 6 p.m. right here at the Brunswick campus. Chris Gore has written a book on healing, living in supernatural healing, and um, he's one of the uh, senior uh, team leaders at Bethel Reading, and so we're really privileged to have him stop out here at Bethel Cleveland, and you won't want to miss that. And a creative Creative Community Night, all right? What is the Creative Community Night? If you are, how many of you feel like you're creative in some way? Do you paint? Do you, can you build set? Would you be good at set design? Do you have carpentry skills? Um, can you sing? Uh, uh, are you creatively gifted? If you are, or just like to join in and say, I, can, I could be a gopher. You know, one of those people that just kind of runs hither and yon and does stuff or whatever. So if you uh, want to have any of those abilities and would really like to join us, we're putting on an amazing Easter presentation this year. And Pastor Steve and Pastor Jay have collaborated on uh, an, an amazing um, little um, uh, presentation for us. And so we're hoping that we will have peace. Do you act? Anybody know? I know some children who can act, <laughs> but if you're an adult, children, whatever, I think if you want to stop out, like to be involved, that's February 18th from 6.30 to 8, right here at the Brunswick campus. All right? Here's Jay, Pastor Jay. Hey, everyone. How's everyone doing today? I am really excited about this Easter production. Um, Pastor Steve had an ingenious idea, I might say, and um, it was God-breathed. You know, we sat down to write it and kind of came up with some ideas, and man, did God just breathe on it. And that's one of the things I so appreciate about Bethel Cleveland is um, our response to the Spirit. There are so many ideas and things that happen that you just put it into the air here, and it, like, catches fire and it expands. I just wanted to share really briefly with you before we take up our tithes and offerings. Who's ready for that? Yes. <laughs> um, I was in Akron last week speaking, and um, there was a, a lady there that I met. She had come specifically to prove her sister wrong about the Lord. She had even done some preemptive Bible reading to prove her sister wrong about God. And when she came in, the scripture references in my sermon were what she read that morning. And she encountered God powerfully in worship. And she spent a good 45 minutes up at the altar just getting her heart right with the Lord right then and there. This is the kind of seed that you're sowing into. It's not just for incredible services and encounters. This is life's change. This is what the blood of Jesus paid for. So when you give, give in faith. You know, he's going to bless you over and above, and that's amazing. But when you give into this soil, it is yielding eternal results and lives that are being pulled into the presence of God and relationship with Jesus that are changed forever. So thank you. Why don't you stand up as in faith? I want to do that activational thing. Do we have that? Do we have those up there? If you're going to give a um, check or for envelope, you can drop those off in the boxes out on your way out those doors. Um, huh? We don't have time? Okay, cool. All right, so just say this with me real quick. As we receive today's offering, we are believing the Lord for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, it's favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interests and incomes, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, debts paid off, expenses decrease, blessing and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of my financial needs, that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Bless the offering in Jesus' name. Here's what's happening this week at Bethel Cleveland. Hey, Bethel Cleveland. We are so glad you're here today. Here are some things coming up. 
If you're between the ages of 18 and 39, we want to invite you to be a part of our next Young Adults Offsite event. On Friday, February 12th at 6 p.m., we will be going ice skating in downtown Cuyahoga Falls and having dinner at Crave Cantina. Check out the events page on BethelCleveland.com for more information. If you are new to our Bethel community, we want you to be a part of our Growth Track. Growth Track is a one-day opportunity to learn more about Bethel Cleveland. You'll learn all about our core values, ministries, and how to get connected. Join us at any of our campuses on Sunday, February 21st. Sign up online at BethelCleveland.com to receive more information. Mark your calendars for our next ministry team training starting on Sunday, March 7th. If you're interested in being a part of our Bethel ministry teams for Sunday services, special events, or traveling teams, then join us for the six-week class. You will learn how to move in the prophetic, healing prayer, and freedom ministry. Hi, I'm April Conkey, and I'm the community director here at Bethel Cleveland. And I'm so excited to announce what we have planned for us to gather together as a family this year. With our theme of Stronger Together, we're looking forward to creating connected communities here at Bethel Cleveland, making both time and space for us to know one another more than ever before. And so with that, we're gonna be having gather groups and monthly gather nights throughout this year as ways for us to encounter God through community. Gather groups, formerly known as growth groups, are where we will gather together either in someone's home or with people of similar interests, building a new depth of a relationship with our family here. And then gather nights are gonna be a time to come together as a church to just have fun as a family. These will be a once a month event where we will play games and get creative and just hang out. The focus of these nights is to just have fun, to laugh and to truly enjoy one another. And when you come to one of our gather nights, you can discover even more ways to get involved and foster community here. Our first gather night will be on Thursday, February 25th at 7 p.m. We'll meet at the Brunswick campus and this will be the first of many more gather nights to come. If you're interested in leading a gather group, attending a gather group, or if you wanna learn more about our gather nights, please come and see me after the service. I'll be in the lobby at our gather together table, and I would love to learn what you're excited about and to get you plugged in. I can't wait to get to know you more and to get you connected to gather together this year. Good. How's everybody doing on this cool day today? Yeah, beautiful. Open your Bibles if you could. We're going to go to somewhere. You know what? We're going we're gonna to go to Matthew, and then we're going to jump over to Ephesians and do all this in 30 minutes. So, so get ready. Uh, I, I, this is starting a new series uh, in our Strong Together year. You know, obviously, coming back from COVID, we're still in the process of whatever that's going to look like, but we're already looking ahead. We're looking ahead to where God's taking us, what's his trajectory in our lives as a group. We know that it's big time community. God wants us to really join together. This is not only a trend in culture right now, it's been a trend in the church for 2,000 years. So we wanna join together, get to know one another. It's important and I'll explain to you why in just a few minutes. But he's calling us also to join together, not just for mutual edification or building up, but to grow stronger together as a group, that as a group and as an entity that's here of the ecclesia, which is the Greek word for church, the called out ones, we've got purpose, we've got a voice. And I've been conflicted these past uh, probably, well, since the beginning of the year. So what's that? Six weeks, I guess, five weeks. Uh, I feel such a, a pull toward a direction of connection and commitment and so forth but also feel a real pull toward having a voice. Uh, in, a, in a season of our history where voices are being silenced, the whole cancel culture thing that's hitting every one of us. I mean, you may be in agreement or disagreement. It all depends on kind of which side of the spectrums you're on, I guess. But I can tell you this, that Jesus doesn't cancel people. Jesus doesn't have a big eraser, which is he goes, that's it, you're out. Aren't you glad that you live in a Jesus culture that that doesn't do that. And yet we are in a culture right now in America where there's a, there's a push toward that. And we're, we're really praying against that, actually. You know, we're praying that God will allow every person to have a voice, even if it's a voice that 
we disagree with. And so we're in that tension of being a prophetic church. Prophetic church has got to have a reputation, you know, they're a little edgy. They say things they probably shouldn't say. They're not real community oriented. Well, we're, we want to create something fresh and new with the prophetic. We actually want a voice, but we want a voice of love. We want a voice that speaks into situations and has the love of God attached to it so truly we can speak the truth in love. Not some kind of guise of love, but literally people will feel the love of God in how we communicate with one another. There's some, turn to the person next to you and say, do you have problems communicating with me? Just ask them that. A lot, for those of you online, there's a lot of discussion going on right now, especially between couples. Yeah. Yeah, remember, you know, the scripture, the age-old scripture that we always use in church is so powerful that it says, for God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his very best. So love is marked by giving. This is our love month. We're focusing on it every Sunday this month. I'm going this week, next week. Jerry's going to do the third week, and Chris Gore is going to do the fourth week. We want to explore what love looks like. I'm especially excited about next week, Valentine's Day. We're giving a free gift out to everyone. We just want to show love in a practical way. But also, it's, it's about the, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, sometimes in charismatic circles, we're very keen to know the work of the Spirit of God called spiritual gifts, which is spirit gifts. It's the Spirit of God. But, but there's also this part in the Bible that talks about spirit fruit, spiritual fruit. And so a couple years ago, you know, this has been this kind of theological, practical battle, I think, in the church for a long time, determining which comes first. Does it take the fruit of the Spirit to engage you in spiritual gifts? I, I could argue that side. I could argue that. But it was a couple years ago, it became revelation to me because if we wait for everyone to get perfect, we're going to get nothing done. Hey, you can't be used because you're not perfect. You can't be used because I don't like the way you dress today. You can't be used because... I heard that you lost your temper. You can't be used because I don't like, I mean, it can go on and on and on. Whatever your prejudice is, just insert that in right there. But what we realize is God, God actually uses processes to conform you into the image of God. We need one another. I know you don't like that. You know, the Bible says, I quote this often, I think it's a great verse, iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. One man sharpens another. That when you're together, there's rubbing going on. What? You believe what? You're a Democrat. You're a Republican. Don't tell me you voted for Trump. Don't tell me you voted for Biden. How old are you? Kind of bold, aren't you? Like 40's pretty old. Yeah. I'm just joking. You live where? Bruns, Tucky? Hmm. I mean, the judgments, they go on and on, and we decide real quick, don't really want to hang out with that group. Did you know some of the best relationships I've had in my life are ones that I didn't plan and that initially I didn't really like? I'm not going to mention who it, are, who it is because then people will go, whoa, he's talking about me, and... You didn't like me at the beginning. Now I'm hurt. I'm leaving the church. I'm going somewhere, so I'm not going to mention it. <laughs> but God brings about people in your life that initially you prejudge. That's prejudice. You prejudge. You go, yeah, I mean, you, I mean you're a Christian, so you make it look good. You know, I love them. They're great people and everything. It's just not who I really want to hang out with. We actually isolate ourselves now from people, you know, and, and we, we have frameworks within Christianity to legitimize not loving somebody else. We do. I just don't feel it's good for where I am right now to be around that person. I just need to hold them out of my life. I mean, we've read so many books on boundaries and, and you know, how to, how to stay in perfect. But let me tell you, perfect peace has nothing to do actually with who you're with. Perfect peace, peace has to do with who's in you. If 
if Christ is in you, he goes for the broken, hurting, different people. And I preached out of John 4 on our Wednesday night uh, Bible study called Deeper. It is really good. I watched it this week online. Ryan Otto, our, one of our new pastors up in Middleburg, did it. Did a great job. Very connective, funny guy, you know. Really got the scripture and actually taught people how to study the word of God. It was very good. Every Wednesday night you can join us. I think it hangs around on the internet for you know, to eternity till Jesus comes. But anyway, on Wednesday night, it's live and you can, you know, ask questions and things like that. We have a moderator. But, you know, it's, when I was teaching it a couple of weeks ago, I got into John 4. I volunteered for John 4 because I love John 4 because John 4, as I mentioned last week, is Jesus taking the shortest, most efficient route from where he was to he was heading north into uh, Galilee and he went through a forbidden zone by the spiritual leaders called Samaria. Now remember, Jesus had in his heart a promise that he was gonna communicate a couple years later that his believers were to go to Jerusalem, Judea, which is kind of, you could say, the county or area. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. He specifically talks about a region that is forbidden from religious people going to and the uttermost parts of the world just to cover everything that he might have missed. But he specifically mentions Samaria because Samaria would irritate Pharisees, religious people. They'd be like, Samaria? What would, what would you hang? So he goes to a city that has a nickname, Sychar, which I mentioned last week, which meant drunkenness, liars, cheats. So you can imagine having a city that has a nickname. Like if they said Cleveland was, say, the mistake on the lake or something, you know, which they did for a long time. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's the cold north, you know, it's the rust belt, it's the rusty city. It's, I mean, there was all kinds of names. I remember uh, my, my, uh, uh, the code name for Cleveland back in CB radio days. You remember that? Hello, Breaker, Break, Break One Nine. You remember that? It was about a three year period where we had the internet in the 70s. And you were connected, all truckers had CB radios, and now so did people. So it was like we were bombarded. Yeah, you know, break one nine, uh, calling out to that uh, Smokey, uh, just came uh, northbound on the uh, I-71. Uh, so we're helping people out to know, connecting with one another, you know. I know some of you young people are like, what, what is that? It happened, it happened for a three year period. I was Buckeye boy. This Buckeye boy heading south on 71 uh, through Brunstucky. And uh, just letting you know, there's a Smokey uh, sitting on the left there. You might want to, on the eastbound side, you might want to keep an eye out for him. All right, good. I did my, my community service, you know. <laughs> but if I was heading toward Cleveland, I was coming from the big C, Columbus, up to the dirty city. That's what it was in the 70s. The dirty city was Cleveland. And so there's these nicknames. Jesus goes to the nickname town that means drunkenness. He meets in a public drinking hole. I don't want to compare that to anything that's going on right now. But he goes to a public drinking hole in midday and meets and talks with a woman. All these things are no, no, no. Now I'm not saying you go out to a drinking hole and talk with a woman. That's not what I'm saying. I'm telling you what Jesus did. And he did it because he knew that there was a key to open all of Samaria through one woman who was living in a sinful situation. She was living with another guy. By the way, that's sin, according to the Word of God. Just in case, it's called fornication in Scripture. You know, in case you're looking it up, want to make sure. It's, it's a sin. He speaks to her. She says, I, I ha have no husband. And he says, you speak right. You've had five husbands, and the one you're living with is not your husband. So Jesus goes in, touches the core of this woman's position and where she is, probably aggravates her because she changes the subject, gets on something else. But Jesus knows this is going to end well and it's going to be a key. She tells the whole area about what Jesus did and multitudes of people come to know Jesus Christ. And so love penetrates 
dark places, goes into difficult people, goes, breaks all prejudices, by the way. It goes into neighborhoods and places you would not normally go to, but it brings the light of God. It brings the love of God to demonstrate that Jesus Christ and his church are here to show something that's very different than what the world is offering. Love. Love together. There it is right there. Love together. I mean, all these songs, I get into my car, I got Sirius Radio, you know, I love living, listening to 70s music, so I've got a number one preset is 70s music. And I sing it all, you know. I go through all the songs. I love it when I'm going somewhere, you know. It's, a, you know, and this week it was, uh, uh, what is it, Sly and the, uh, uh, just there's some other 70s people there, I know. <laughs> I knew that, I was just checking, but. You know, we are family. And I'm driving down the road. We are family. <laughs> All of my sisters and me. I mean, we were. <laughs> and I'm hitting it the best I can. You know, you sing in other voices when you're in a shower and places like that. Because you know no one listens. So I can do whatever I want. Don't judge me. <laughs> and so I'm singing, you know, we are family. And then other songs come to me, you know, about uh, all you need is love. All you need is love. love. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> love is all you need. Na, 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 na. I mean, you go through it. It's like, oh, there's kind of been a theme around for a while. People want to be connected. People want love. People don't want rejection. But we continue to sow that in our hearts. So I've been conflicted between these two things, and I'm, I'm mixing it up right now. But it, it hits me when I hear that... Uh, John the Baptist came out of the wilderness. Why did people go to the wilderness to see a wild man who's been eating locusts and, and wild honey? I mean, you meet this man. I'm sure he had a healthy beard. He was Jewish. Lived in the wilderness. I don't know how he smelled. But he lived in the wilderness. He probably had a starry gaze in his eye. Repent! For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. People were afraid of, but they were also entertained by it. The Pharisees, everyone would go to see John the Baptist. Like, what's he going to do today? It's a picture of the church. Not that we look weird and smell bad, but there's something about we come out of the wilderness and we have a voice, a voice in the wilderness, a voice that speaks out of a difficult time. It says, repent and prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his way straight. So I have that in my heart. I mean, I feel that prophetic unction to want to speak where voices are being silenced. I, I, I'm so tempted, you know, to just speak with a greater clarity, but I really do feel we're in a season right now where the Lord is readjusting our thinking. He's getting us out of a political consciousness. We've been afraid of political spirits in the church, and no, no doubt they are there in some places. But what about the political spirit in our very government and people have attached to that and they've, they've been swept up with something that, that gets them off of a central understanding of the kingdom of God. On, on January 6th, when I saw people charging into the Capitol building, I was not excited about it. I was grieved by it, especially because I saw the flag, the United States flag going in, and then right behind it was a flag that said Jesus. And I thought, oh, no, no, the Crusades are back again. That, that, boy, it's quiet right now. But the violence that our only reaction after thousands of years of soaking in the presence of God is violence. That's not right. And I know that they don't represent everyone in the United States, but it's a sector. It's a, it's a piece of Christianity in the United States and the world is appalled. Christians around the world are appalled at what happened in America. It, it is not celebrated around the world. And so things come to my mind like, remember, remember Peter when, he, when, he, when the guards were coming to get Jesus and, and the high priest had a servant there and his name was Malchus. Do you remember that? And I don't know what Malchus was doing, but Malchus was there with others to arrest Jesus. Peter, in expected fashion, pulls out his sword and swings at the guy. And the tradition is, it doesn't say this exactly in Scripture, but the tradition is, I mean, how do you get a sword and only cut an ear off? That's a, that's a pretty good aim, actually. But they believe that he was going to cut his head off. Malchus, in response to seeing a sword, would have 
would move like this and shoo, cut his ear off, falls on the ground. And, and he's told to put his sword away. And Jesus reaches down, takes, this is, the, this is the picture of the church. You know, as some are cutting ears off, some need to heal and put the ears back on. It's funny, it's cutting the hearing off, cutting the hearing off. But the church reaches down and gets the ear and say, here, let me, I may not agree with what you're doing. I may not agree that you're arresting my Savior right now, but that was not right here. Let's put this back on. And you imagine they still arrested him. Like if you had been there seeing that, you see the guy's ear laying on the ground. All of a sudden Jesus picks it up and puts it back on with some kind of supernatural glue. He puts it on there and says, oh, he, I guarantee you Malchus heard better than he'd ever heard before. In fact, there's tradition uh, no way of substantiating this, that Malchus became a follower of Jesus Christ. And so you look at that and you go, that makes sense, that kind of makes sense. So Peter is now goes through about a 50-day period, it's a little more than that, but a 50-day period where God moves him from the natural response of being violent to the natural response of, of deep compassion and the burden of the Lord. Because on the day of Pentecost, he stands up and lifts up his voice. His voice is now the sword. He's not cutting ears off, he's cutting hearts. It says it in the Bible. They were cut to the heart with what he said, and they gave their lives, 3,000 of them, to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting. When it gets out of the hand, when it gets out of the hand of violence being the solution for believers in Jesus Christ and move to the side of, let me give you some true history here of what just happened. And let me tell you right now, it is in Jesus Christ and him alone. When you begin to speak like that, you're gonna cut to the heart. You're gonna make enemies for sure. It's called the sufferings of Christ. You're gonna make enemies, but you're gonna cut hearts open. Now Peter, the one who cut ears off years later, or, or 50 days later, is now doing surgery in people's hearts with what he says. He says, well, it's a one-off. No, it isn't. It's an outlier. It doesn't, I mean, it's not, I mean, yeah, that was a one, you know, that was one point. It was Peter, he's with Jesus, I get it. Contextually, that's historically true, but I mean, there's nothing we can really draw out of that. Yeah, that's true. Until you think of Moses. And you think of Moses when he escaped with over a million people out of Egypt and literally took their gold and silver, which was given to them. It was the grace of God. Here, take this. You imagine that? Here, I have $100,000. Would you just take it for me? I mean, you'd be like, Sure, I can take that. And then you leave. You leave the country. They get out of the wilderness. They get out in the wilderness, and immediately we know what happens. This was a consistent pattern of the children of Israel, of which the church is compared to many times. They get out in the wilderness, and they complain. Where's God? You know, they just came out of being saved through uh, a, 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 a sea the Red Sea that needed to be departed. I know there's all kinds of rumors. Well, it wasn't the Red Sea. It was the Reed Sea. There was a Reed Sea back then too, which was actually just a swamp. And I remember my pastor preaching when I was a little boy. It sticks in my head. He said the greatest miracle, if that's true, he said the greatest miracle happened that was even uh, possibly greater than the uh, miracle that we believe in, that the waters parted and everyone walked through on dry ground. And so if it was just, they said, well, it was just like a swamp and period times of the year, that swamp is dry. And so, you know, that wasn't that big of a miracle. I mean, they just walked out and, and, and you can say, okay, let's say I agree with that. The next thing, he took a little swamp that's like ankle deep and buried the enemies of God. All of Egypt, his horse and riders thrown to sea. Can you imagine a valiant warrior laying in about six inches of water going, I can't get up. I can't get up. An entire army doing that? No. This was a sea. Walls were on each side. You saw the movie. They walked right through the middle of it like, you know, I'd be walking pretty fast. I would definitely wouldn't be in the back row. And so you get through that, and they look back like, oh, no, the enemies of God are following us through in the middle of that. And the Bible says all of a sudden the wheels started falling off, and the dry ground got muddy. It was like a little leak in the bottom of this thing, you know, and, and, and they're, they're falling down enough time for Israel to get totally out of the water. And then, boom, it all closes in. And they dance. Remember Miriam? Horse and rider thrown into the sea. We sang that in the 70s just came to me 
It's the celebration that my enemies were cut off. So Moses gets on the other side. You think this would be such an incredible event that the rest of their lives, they're like, oh, I believe God for anything. I believe God for money. I mean, look, he, I believe God for water. I believe God for food. But they, they were constantly complaining. Lord, I mean, it's like grandchildren. We had them over for six hours yesterday. There's a lot of complaints between the three of them. Constant complaints, you know. I mean, and that, I think it's okay for six hours. But for 40 years? 40 years? So they get to this place and it's, there's no water, there's no water. So Moses goes to the rock. They said, we've been better off in Egypt. Better off, why don't you just say, well, who are you? Why did you bring us out of here to Brunstucky? Why'd you bring us out of this place just to die and be dry out here? I don't get it. Why, why, why? And so Moses he comes to the Lord and says, Lord, they're complaining. They, they want to go back to Egypt. He said, I'll tell you what to do. Strike the rock. Strike the rock and water will come out. So he goes out there. He strikes this big rock. Now, this is so interesting because there was a Jewish tradition. There's still a Jewish tradition that a rock with water followed them for 40 years in the wilderness. But there was a literal rock, rock that would follow them and supply water. They were supplied water out of this rock that he struck for 40 years. 40 years. In fact, in Corinthians, it says that. It says, and that rock that followed them in the wilderness was Christ. Whoa, what? What? We, what? And so the striking of the rock was a picture in the midst of complaint that Jesus would be the representative, that Jesus received the strikes, the stripes in his own physical body. What's interesting though, 40 years later, Moses' sister dies, Miriam, and at her death, the, the water ceased to flow out of the rock. Theologians are at a mystery about that. What does that really mean? We don't really know. It was an end of an era, beginning of a new era. Here they stand on the edge of the promised land, which represents the promise of God. They stand on the edge of the promised land. Will they walk into that promised land? What do they do? They complained after, after all these years, 40 years of having water, they complained that the water stopped. How many of you know that sometimes the water stops so you can believe for something greater? So he goes, Moses goes to to the Lord, and he says, Lord, the water stopped. They're complaining because there's no water. What does God say? Do you remember? He said, Moses, go speak to the rock. Oh, he went from striking the rock to speaking to the rock. Why? Because it's part of the transformation of the Christian walk. Going from violence, anger, frustration, into somebody who's able to shape things with what they say, with what they communicate. All he had to do was go out there and say, water, come forth. Water, come forth. And poof, to come. But he got angry. He got frustrated because everyone was complaining. The grandkids were running all over the place, yelling all kinds of things. It's mine, 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 yours, mine. I mean, they don't say yours. Mine, mine, mine. You know, going back and forth. This is what was happening to millions of people out there for 40 years. Uh, I mean, what you, oh boy. I mean, uh, Moses was just like, oh, please, get me out of this situation. But well, he didn't know he was about to get out of that situation. He was told by God to speak to the rock. He got so frustrated, he struck it twice. Boom! And water came out. Just like the other rock. But he came back to the Lord, probably like, all right, I got that done. He said, listen, you lost trust in who I am. And because of it, you will not enter into the promises of God. Wow. He and Aaron both. What? Lord, the water still came out. It's not always the end. It's the means. I was introducing a whole new understanding after their 40 years in the wilderness that the rod is not necessary anymore. The voice coming out of the heart, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It will give you everything you need. Now that takes us right now to Ephesians and I wanna just go through this real quick in my last seven minutes here. Uh, Ephesians chapter one through three is a, uh, a very mystical part of scripture. Uh, Ephesians Fortunately, it's divided into two parts, first three chapters, second three chapters. And uh, I want to look at this, how the Lord wants to shape us. Did you know the most powerful thing 
regarding heaven and earth. Don't we believe that? Like, that kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we always think about external things or processes we're working through or whatever. Lord Jesus, that kingdom come, that will be done. In fact, literally in the Aramaic, it says, come thy kingdom, be done thy will. It's a very directive kind of a thing, you know. That's the Lord's prayer. And so we're bringing heaven to earth. It's always funny to say, oh, Lord, this person I'm praying for, may heaven come down and touch their body, touch their heart. Whatever. What we seldom realize is that that same power of heaven is going to come right here into my heart. Your greatest promised land in your life is you. It's you. Well, I'm not real comfortable with that. You're the problem. I'm looking in the mirror right now. I'm the problem too. The problem is me. It's not who's around you because you can transcend that. It's not the circumstances around you. You can transcend that. It's not someone holding you back. You can transcend that. Love can get shaped in your heart and open doors that would never be opened by you. And trust me, the doors he opens up are way better than the doors you get by manipulating or control or whatever it might be. And so in the first three chapters, he talks about the heavenly relationship. You must understand the heavenlies. You must understand the process. But, but think what this says. I'll, I'll just cover it real quick. Ephesians 1 says, Blessed be the Lord our God, Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. So you begin to understand. We understand the blessing side. Bring it down, Lord. <laughs> thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And Steve Witt, as it is in heaven. He's blessed me with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy without blame before him in love. Well, that's enough right there. You just read that you could chew on that for a couple years right there. Ephesians 1.9, he says, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, he wanted to give you, he wanted to show you the secrets that in the disp dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one. I love that, gather together. Gather together in one all things in Christ, both, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Do you see what he's saying here? He's saying he's gonna knit something together down here on earth from the power of heaven, like what's in heaven will come down to earth and it's gonna be done through him. The unity of the spirit. Sorry, I gotta read a little faster. So if you can't understand me, pray for interpretation. Ephesians 2 says this, it moves on. One, two, and three. Remember chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three is, is what's going on in heaven. Why we, the power that is accessible through us in heaven. Chapter two says, and we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. I wish I could do a chant right now. I've been in a chanting mood lately. You know, it says this. There's three parts to it. We are his. He has prepped. We should do. We are his. He has prepped. We should do. That's what it, that's what it boils down to. We are his. He has prepared us since the foundation of the world that we should do what he's told us to do. This is not some lazy Christianity. It's not a lexical, you know, well, let's just see what happens. And I don't know. I'm just kind of moving in life. And, you know, I'm praying for favor. Of course, I want favor. But there's no impact on our soul. Our souls remain corrupted, separated. I'm trying to think of words to help here. Displeasing to God. Even though we're believers following him. We align ourselves with him in order to move toward greater purity. It is one of our greatest gifts to the Lord saying, Jesus impacted my life and transformed who I am. All right. Ephesians 2 and 3 says things like, uh, I'm just going to skip through it here. We are strangers that are becoming a household. We're being built together for a dwelling place. This, these are, this is heaven's intention. Let me put it really plain. This is what Jesus expects. <laughs> of believers, followers. I don't know what our expectations are in the American church. I know what mine have been in the past, but I'll tell you one thing. I mean, I love things to grow. I believe it's good to be fruitful. I believe it's good to add people. It's good to open up and, and allow people to know the goodness and grace of God and everything else. But, 
But really what he's doing is he's building us together as a dwelling place that he may come and fill us up. When that happens, people will know what's going on. The church is important as a counterculture. Right now, it does not have any influence in America right now, or very little. Uh, partly because of January 6th. So right now, we're rebuilding a culture that is counter to the culture that is out there. That's why I don't, I don't want to put certain things in my mouth and in my communication because I believe that that's the culture that says that. I want to come up with a counterculture that transcends the current culture because the current culture is not moving in the right direction. It says that we're to be rooted and grounded in love. I mean, the very core of who we are is about love. Knowing the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. In other words, the church is to, is to have a taste that is what heaven looks like. People should encounter you, talk with you, and say, you know, for the first time in my life, I, I understand what heaven is. I understand who Jesus is. I know you're an imperfect person. I've worked with you for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever. But there's something of, that's, that's come on in your life right now. There's a light that has come on. It's like life is in you, and that life has become a light to all men. Wouldn't that be fun? That's exactly what Jesus did in John 1. So it's the testimony that we're moving forward that people will see in us something different. So we are moving from mystery, the first three chapters in Ephesians, mystery to mastery. And I'll conclude with this in Ephesians 4. So land with me. This is the landing pad of heaven on you. In Ephesians 4, and I'm me. Chapter 4, verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. Is everyone looking at this? You need, you, you get on your phone. Get uh, a Bible Gateway app or Bible Hub or one of those. Logos has a good one. Uh, check it out. Get there or, or pull out your trusty Bible. I brought mine up here. Pull out your trusty Bible. Ephesians 4, you need to see it. You need to engage all senses. We don't have any incense today, so I can't do smell. But I can tell you this, you're going to taste and see the goodness of the Lord and the directives of heaven and the intentionality of the Father's Son, Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 says this, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. We don't use that every day now, but it's a, it's a begging plea. Look, please, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Is that powerful? We're being taught, this is a heaven to earth thing. God is speaking to us from heaven saying, walk worthy. When I don't believe in works. I don't believe that it's all about me and I, I just trust fully in the Lord. Uh, okay, I get that. If you're trusting fully in the Lord though, heaven is impacting your life and you are being transformed on a daily basis. Three people agree. I, I'm so happy about that. It says with, oh, I'm, hearing, I'm hearing sounds from heaven now. Joseph. It says, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. This is scripture, folks. Enduring. I think it, what does it say in your word? Endeavoring, which is, I, I looked it up. It means zealously fast. <laughs> so, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, that's heaven. In the bond of peace, that's earth. You see that? The unity of spirit we are bringing down in a bond of peace. It's a commitment of peace among us that as a church, we will walk together in a bond of peace because of the unity of the spirit that is over us. Think about it. Where is that in our lives right now? Are we walking in the bond of peace. Or we created our own theology, our own Christianity that's separate from the Word of God. Well, I pick and choose who I hang with and who I'm with. And some people I just don't like. I mean, we all have those people we just don't like. You know, we don't like people that are this way or that way or whatever. I'm telling you that it's not the Spirit of Christ. There's a church that's being formed here right now. That we'll be holy and we'll be pure before God. Not in some kind of 1950s holiness thing where how you look and how you dress and all that stuff. But at the very core, love will come forth because we're, we're worshiping Jesus' people. We live in Ephesians 1 through 3. We are seated in heavenly places. We walk worthy of that call now on earth. It is our testimony, not just what we say. 
We've laid down our swords and we're taking up our voice. We're speaking with love to a generation out of a wilderness. Behold the Lord. Behold the Lamb of God. He takes away the sins from His people. Behold the Lord. Repent. And be restored to the Lord Jesus Christ. Make His way straight. Behold the word of the Lord. There's a passion that comes out of us, a cry coming out of the wilderness. That cry has got to come out of Bethel, Cleveland. In a sense, we are fed up with religion. We're fed up with what the world can offer. We are moving in a Jesus way. It will not be perfect, but they're going to taste and see that the Lord is good. I remember I was in the front row thinking during worship, If a transgender person repents, what does that look like? And the Lord told me, I'm going to raise up. It's going to be controversial. So glad I'm on the internet. He's going to raise up transgenders that will come into the kingdom and purpose of God. The Lord said they would be like eunuchs. I'm like, I need to research that. They will be servants of the Most High God. So, whoa, I don't know what we're going to do with that. Yeah. Just chew on that a while. I just gave you a little introductory course there. You say you, go, you agree with transgenderism? I don't, I don't agree with anything that's bringing destruction or separation from God. Anything. And so we can speak truth. I mean, in America, anyone can pretty much live the way they want to live. But in the church... Lord calls us to holiness and separation. But if we come as any person before God with sin in our life, He can redeem us and draw us into His loving kindness in a very powerful way. So what are we going to do about that? I'm going to let you think about it because I'm not sure myself. It says to, but to each one of us, He's given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. I'll jump down to verse Let's go down to verse uh, 15 because of time. But speaking the truth in love. You got that? Now we use that, as an, we use that verse a lot for telling people hard things and being mean to them. I just got to love you, brother. Yeah, I love you, but I'm going to tell you the truth. How many of you, when you hear that, feel really good about it? <laughs> it's like, oh boy. I need to be honest with you. We have all these little <laughs> phrases we use that mean... Put your seatbelt on. I'm about to obliterate our relationship right now. (laughs) Speaking the truth in love is a truth that has been seasoned out of the presence of God. Sunday morning during worship, truth is being put in. Lies are being dispelled. Judgments are being dispelled. That's why it's so important to come together in the presence of God. Speaking the truth in love, we might grow up. To the person next to you say, would you grow up? Just tell them that. Person next to you. (laughs) We may grow up in all things into Him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together. Stronger together, I like that. (laughs) Joined and knit together to what every joint supplies. That's you. According to the effective working by which every part does its share. I mean, it happens that this month is our volunteer month. We collect, we start recruiting volunteers saying, help us out, help us out. Let me just tell you something. The church is a microcosm of heaven. It's a colony of heaven on earth. Serving in the church breaks prejudice off of you. Serving in the church breaks classism off of you. You're with people you might not normally be with in any other part of your weekly walk. But you come into the church of fellow called out people. And you say, in here, I'm going to learn how to work together. I'm going to volunteer so that when I get outside these walls, I have experience of breaking these walls and things that are in my own mind down. I've learned how to love one another. Church has become just the opposite. You get chewed up and spit out. Please, may we move in the direction of love. Let's all stand together if we could. Uh, your homework is to read the rest of Ephesians 4 
Oh, wow. So good. The rest of Ephesians 4 says, put off, put on, and put away. <laughs> There's things we, you say, I, I, wait, I didn't know I needed to do anything. I just prayed a prayer and received Jesus into my heart. Yeah, the seed of Christ has been put in your heart. And it's going to take over this promised land called Steve Witt. <laughs> I'm still feeling it. I must have a big promised land. Because 50 years later, he's still finding areas that need to be taken out. So right now, I think, is it Jay coming up? Jay's going to lead us in just a few moments here. I know we ran a little late. Sorry. 11 minutes. Not too bad. But I just ask, let Christ Love be formed in you. I hope nobody receives any judgment from what I'm saying. I'm looking in the mirror. I, I have my own problems and challenges I'm faced with on a daily basis. But I understand the Holy Spirit. Grace was given to me through Jesus Christ to overcome this circumstance and to walk as a free person, full of love, embracing all people. You do that out of here into the place called the world, you will stand out as somebody that's advancing a purpose beyond yourself. And that purpose is hidden in Jesus Christ. Jay. So good. So good. It's a good day to know Jesus, isn't it? It's a good day to be in his presence. It's a good day to give your heart to Jesus. You're standing in this room this morning, you're watching online, your heart is not right with God. If you were to stand before him today and there would be a question mark in your heart, I want you to know that Jesus paid every price so that there would be no more questions. So this morning, if you would just bow your heads, close your eyes, or keep them wide open, whatever you want. <laughs> but if you want to give your heart back to Jesus today, or maybe for the first time, I want you to just put your hand up in the air. You know, we live in a time right now where you hear that phrase, I'm just living my truth. And I got to tell you, I am just so thankful that I don't live in my truth, but I exist and live in His truth. You see, everybody else's truth is based on their circumstance or their lens that they've lived through. They've got a lot of things that shape the way that they think life should go or what's right and what's wrong. And it's all different. But the beauty of Jesus and the beauty of God is that He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes, which means that you can trust Trust and depend on him forever. So I know that I saw some hands up. Sorry, I just dropped in my spirit. I had to drop that. That's you. Put your hand up. I want you to give your heart to Jesus this morning. Most incredible thing you'll ever do. There's a couple hands going up. That's amazing. God sees you. You're sitting at home too. Put your hand up. Come on. In your kitchen, your living room. Put your hand up. Activation of faith. Can we give God some praise for people who are giving their hearts back to the Lord today? Come on. It is amazing. And what an incredible journey that Jesus is starting in their life. I remember when I first met Jesus, I was sitting at the altar and I felt his presence for the first time. And I knew that I was never going to be the same. And I got to tell you, my life, everything that surrounds me, the blessing, the glory of God in my life, I'm so thankful every day for the day that I invited Jesus to live in my heart. So if you're praying this, just agree with me as we pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, thank you for everything that you've done. I believe that when Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected, that it paid the price for every one of my sins and it made the path that led me back into relationship with the Father. So today I'm not just praying a prayer, not just reciting a formula, not just going through the motions, but I am surrendering my life to Jesus. I'm surrendering my life to the Father. I'm surrendering my life to the person who hung the stars in the sky, shaped the mountains and knows me deeply and more completely than anybody ever will and loves me most. I'm giving my heart to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I get our ministry teams to come up to the front here? And um, Rachel, if you wouldn't mind singing just that chorus of holy water for them. 
this morning. If you need to, if you need some prophetic ministry or encouragement, our teams are coming up to the front here. They are trained and ready to give you a specific prophetic word of encouragement. But today, I just feel in my spirit, if you felt that, I don't want to live in my truth, but I want to exist in his. Would you just put your hands up in the air right now? You say, God, I want to exist and live in your truth, not just mine, my subjective truth. And I'm just going to bless you. Father God, in Jesus' name, thank you that your truth never changes. Thank you that you are an incredible and worthy God. And this morning we worship and we praise you as free beings under the, under the blood of Jesus in a new life with a new approach who can boldly come before the throne and release heaven on earth. In Jesus' name, we bless you. Go ahead, Rachel. Because your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like a sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like hope. bless you Bethel Cleveland may you go out of this place filled with the presence and glory of God may you live in his truth may he speak to you louder than ever before that you carry his power and glory everywhere you go in Jesus name amen thank you for joining us this week your forgiveness is like sweet sweet honey on my lips it's like the sun Like home.